What's up everyone, DC copyright infringement back at you with another elaborate PowerPoint presentation. So we've all had that moment in elementary school when the teacher is done with class and there's enough time left so they say, everyone who wants to play, insert game of choice here, and everyone flips out. So on the outside you're flipping out with everybody else, but on the inside you are not flipping out because you actually suck. Well, suck no more, because I'm going to show you how to win some common classroom games. The people who haven't caught on by now might be saying, well, what's a classroom game? To me at least, a classroom game is an extremely casual game, no, more casual, even more casual, there we go. These games can also be defined as games most likely to be played in some classroom, hence the name. However, because these games are so simple, there are some strategies that you can use to increase your chances or even guarantee your chances of winning some of these games. Which will bring you one step closer to making your four-year-old niece cry tears of sweet pain. So here we go. First up we have Rock, Paper, Scissors. Now this game is probably the simplest version of an RPG battle that there is. Each player draws Rock, Paper, Scissors, Rock beats Scissors, Scissors beats Paper, and Paper beats Rock, and the person who beats the other one wins. Now, at first, the game might seem like random chance, which it is, but there are some strategies that people use that can be easily countered. For example, it has been found by researchers at undergrad university that in a best out of three scenario, the winner will always stick with their pick for the next round, and the loser will always pick the one that neither of them picked. So, for the first round, pick randomly, and then if you lose, pick the one that neither of you picked. However, if you win, pick the one that they picked for the next round. Of course, they could be using the same strategy, in which case you should, you know, just do this on your dumb friends. Alright, so let's have some practice. So I'm going to count to three, and then on three we both draw. Ready? Three, two, one, gun. I picked gun. You're dead. Next up we have Nim. What? You don't know what Nim is? Well, there are lots of games which are just Nim clones, such as 13, 10, other number games. This is how the gameplay works. On their turn, each player can say up to three numbers. Each player has to build up the last player's sequence. Now, there is some number picked, like 13, and whoever is forced into saying that number at some point loses. For example, in a two-player game, person A might say 1, 2, 3, person B says 4, 5, 6, person A says 7, 8, person B says 9, 10, 11, and person A seals the deal by saying 12, which forces B to say 13, which wins A the game. There is the original tabletop version with matchsticks or marbles or something, but no third grade teacher is going to bust out some matchsticks since that would probably result in arson. And also if I did explain it, half of this video would be me trying to explain adding up binary notation, which would just take too long. If you do want to see it, just type an essay in the comments about how it would change your life, and I'll do it sometime. Now, there isn't a definite way to win if you do this in a group of people, but if you are playing with one other person, there is a way that you can 100% guarantee you win, providing you meet some parameters. Here's how it works. First, if they go first, you can say every number in increments of 4, since 4 is the lowest that can be counted to in one turn between you and your opponent. Think about it this way. If they start with counting to 1, you can count to 3 to get to 4. If they count to 2, you can count to 2 to get to 4. If they count to 3, you can count to 1 to get to 4. No matter what they do, you can always get to 4. And since it restarts after you are at 4, you can get to 8 and so on. Next, find the magic number, or the number that you need to stay to win. It's always 1 less than the losing number. So, in 13, the winning number is 12. Finally, count back in increments of 4. If you count any of these numbers not going over in any turn, you can count the next one in increments of 4 and get to the winning number. 12 being a winning number is lucky, since the other numbers needed to win are 4 and 8, which can always be accessed if you go second. So, go second. In an example where 10 is the losing number, 9 is the winning number, the key numbers are 5 and 1. Since 1 can always be accessed if you go first, go first. If you work this logic for any game of NIM you play, just go first or second based on what you get, and win. Or if your opponent is going in the position that you want to guarantee the victory, just try to get any of the key numbers and you win. 
Uh, that took very long. Well, at least if you are taken hostage and your captor asks you to play a game of Nim to escape, you can crush him and not die. Let's relax after that long explanation with some hangman. You know, the game where whether someone gets executed or not depends on whether you can guess a word? Yeah, that one. I won't talk about it from the guessing perspective, since this video could be classified as a documentary, so what I will say is some of the hardest words you can pick as the person who picks the word. Jazz, buzzard, gazebo, rhubarb, razzmatazz, croquet, voodoo, vortex, rhythms, finks, crypt, and espionage. Those are just some. I included a link to 188 more in the description if you're interested. Now, you can hang that guy more often than not. Lastly, we have possibly the most subjective game of all time, 20 questions. The game where one person thinks of an object and the other person asks you yes or no questions to guess it. Now, you might think that I'll explain some objects that no one can guess, but I'm going to tell you how to guess any object. Yes, there is a way to guess any object that the person thinks of with a very high success rate. For the first question, ask whether the first letter of the word is behind M in the alphabet. From their answer, you can tell which half the letter is within the alphabet. Then, find which half it's on in that half. Continue until you get the letter. Since it takes four to five questions to guess each letter, you can guess either the first four or five letters of the word. But, we can be more efficient. You can tell whether a letter is a vowel or a consonant based on the letters that come before it. For example, if the first two letters are TH, SH, or CH, then the next letter is almost always a vowel. So, if you know it's probably a vowel, divide the alphabet so there are an equal amount of vowels on each side. Do this until the selection of letters only has one vowel. That is the letter. Letters which are guaranteed to be a vowel can be guessed in two to three questions, which can be used to make it more efficient. So, you can guess an average of six to seven letters. And given the first six letters, the average word can be guessed. If you are unsure of the word and have some extra questions, narrow down the possibilities with some subjective questions, and you will most likely guess it. So that's it. As you know, there are many more than four classroom games, like Tic-Tac-Toe, Dots and Boxes, Crunker.io. So if you really liked this video, comment, I want three bottles of antibacterial soap, to show that you made it to the end and want more. If there is demand, expect part 2 in June or something. But at least now you have the resources to destroy that little brat on the playground. Next, you just need to know how not to seem like a pedophile talking to kids during recess. Have a nice day.